Hi everyone, welcome back to our final episode of A Bigger Table Politics. Uh, you're going to you're going to hear Wayne Harlos from the Douglas County Libertarian Party speak in uh, just a minute, but I just wanted to give kind of an update. Since we started this podcast until episode 4, a lot has happened. It has felt like a year in these 4 weeks. Uh, but the biggest thing, as we may all know, is COVID-19, and that has changed our lives and how we go about our lives every day right now. And we have seen how this virus has been used as a political football uh, for both sides, uh, at, le at least at the beginning. But now at this point, it seems like everybody's on the same page and we're all working together towards a common goal. And my prayer is that we don't forget that after this, but that even... Maybe it takes something like COVID-19 to separate us for a while in order to unite us. And so I'm hoping that this is a, a lesson for our politics, for our country, that we all belong to each other, that what Christ came to tell us is that it's not just about us individually, but it's about us as a larger community. How do we take care of the less vulnerable? And we're seeing that happen in the United States right now as we are changing our lives to protect the most vulnerable for this disease. So in the meantime, enjoy my conversation with Wayne. I got in touch with you because I wanted to do this podcast, a uh, bigger table based on politics. And I contacted the Douglas County Libertarian Party and you were the one that reached out to me. So can you tell me a little bit about your history with politics, what it means to you and the Libertarian uh, uh, political party and what that means in your everyday life? Sure. Um, I've been fairly active politically since my first opportunity to vote, which was in 1980. And uh, I found, found myself more closely aligned with the Republican Party uh, at that time. Um, but I had some struggles with the Republican Party even from then. Uh, but as time went on, the, the Republican Party got away from their conservative values, especially fiscally. And there were several things that I just couldn't come to terms with with the Republican Party. And as they kept moving away from me, sooner or later they moved away from me so far that I could not, uh, in good conscience, stay as a Republican. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, wife, who is um, at the time was apolitical, uh, I came home from the office one day and she was sitting uh, on our couch and uh, had her laptop out and she said, I'm going to show you something. And remember, she's apolitical. And one of her friends recommended that she read, she was to read the uh, um, uh, platform of the Libertarian Party. She did. She changed her party affiliation right then. She went into the Secretary of State's website, changed her party affiliation to Libertarian at that point. Once again, she was apolitical, so she was a registered Republican as a Christian, because that's what Christians do, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. registered Republicans. Um, yeah. But she never voted. She was never involved. She never followed anything. Um, but uh, I read the platform. I said, well, that aligns with my thought process better than uh, the Republican Party, certainly. Um, I'm a constructionist, uh, which is somebody that, that believes in the, uh, the intent as well as the writing of the Constitution. Um, the original intent, I think, is as important to study as what is written on paper. Mm -hmm. And um, the Libertarian Party certainly stands for the Constitution much more closely than either of the other parties. Uh, so I started studying the Libertarian Party, and we started going to all the local Libertarian meetings, that we could, everyone that we could go to in dri drive, drivable distance. And um, um, I went to the state convention. I was, a still, I was still a registered Republican, so I could go to the convention, but I couldn't participate in the business session. You had to be a registered Libertarian in order to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, uh, I was given a different perspective on the world than I had ever been exposed to before. And so right after the convention, I switched my uh, party affiliation to Libertarian and started studying the principles and philosophies that not only started the party, uh, but also what's happening in today's world. And uh, I found that it aligned much more closely with my views than uh, either of the other parties did. Mm -hmm. And what are those views? Can you, for people that are listening that don't necessarily have a good hold of 
the idea of what a libertarian is? What What are some basics? You know, there's a lot of people that don't know uh, what the Libertarian Party stands for. Uh, you know, and I'll give you a quick example. Um, we had a booth at the Castle Rock Starlighting, and we had people coming up to us all day, and none of them knew about the Libertarian Party. Now, we've been a party since 1972, and we're the only minor party that has ballot access in all 50 states. Mm -hmm. And uh, But people still didn't know what we stand for. So they were coming up to the booth, and of course we were given the opportunity to educate them about what we believe for. We had a laptop there. We had over 20 people change their party affiliation at our booth. Wow. And so it was really interesting. But um, the Libertarian Party stands for, um, I'll give you a, the, the quick and dirty of it, yeah. is uh, the Libertarian Party stands for don't, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. And that's, that's the um, kind of the joke about it. Uh, but the philosophy is that people have the right to um, have their own freedoms. They should also have the responsibility that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. And right now, with all the laws that have been enacted by the other two parties, people are no longer given the responsibility of their actions. They're just given the, the rules to follow. Mm -hmm. And the Libertarian Party believes that that's an individual thing. And we have to take responsibility for actions, but we should also have the freedoms that go along with that. Um, and there's a lot of examples that I can give you, but that's the overall gist of it. Um, we believe that the fruits of people's labor should be theirs. Mm -hmm. um, we believe that any type of um, taxation is coercion. Yeah, it's not voluntary, it's coercion. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a belief in our society that we have to take people's income uh, for the betterment of society. Well, there's other ways to generate revenue rather than through what we consider to be theft, mm -hmm. which is taking somebody's income without their agreement. Right. Okay. So then, um, for you personally, how how do does your politics with the Libertarian Party and your faith intersect? How do <laughs> how does one inform the other? Um, the question I often ask people is. Is your faith informing your politics, or is your politics informing your faith? Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Um, that's a difficult question because there are two different directions you could look at it. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. When it comes to charity, mm -hmm. uh, right now within our world, charity is mostly done by the government. Yeah. It takes a personal responsibility away from people. Um, Jesus did not say that we are to elect people to take money from other people to pay to help the people that are in need. Mm -hmm. He said you are to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Libertarian Party stands for. Um, charity, charity should be something that we do ourselves. That way, number one, it has a better effect on the people that we're caring for. But when you are paying taxes, and then a portion of that money, and we know only a small, small portion of the money that is set aside for a certain program, actually gets there, yeah. um, which is a bureaucratic problem that we, we can have another conversation at yeah. another time. <laughs> um, there's no personal responsible, responsibility from the person that's receiving the care, nor is there any opportunity for the person that is giving the care, an opportunity to reach out and see if you can help them implement that care in the most effective manner. Mm -hmm. So the Libertarian Party believes that everything should be voluntary, not coercive. Mm -hmm. And that's just one example. Yeah. Um, for you, the candidates that you support, uh, is it because their values are, the, are important to you? Or is it just simply they're wearing the right jersey so like they would you vote for any libertarian candidate uh trusting that that person is representing libertarian values or um do you support candidates based on how you see their values played out good question um the the libertarian party does things a little bit differently than the other parties um as an example in colorado if we have a candidate that want, wants to run for the House a house seat mm -hmm. or even a federal office, um, that candidate at our convention has to get up in front of the delegates at the convention and they have an opportunity to give their speech, mm -hmm. you know, uh, exposing their views. 
uh-huh. then the delegates have an opportunity to either accept that person as a candidate or not. That's our vetting process. We don't have a formal primary like the big two parties have. Um, so nine times out of ten, anybody that is vetted by the delegates aligns with the majority of the libertarian philosophy and certainly the most important, important which is the statement of principles. Mm-hmm. And our statement of principles is the, the it's, it's the heart of our, all of our founding documents. It was actually written in 1972 when the party was formed. And coincidentally, the party was formed here in Colorado, which is interesting. That makes a lot of sense, actually, to yeah. me. <laughs> About Colorado, too. Yes, very much yes. so. I, I, I often have told people I view Colorado very much as more um, libertarian in a lot of ways. Instead of, okay. you know, some people think we're more liberal. We used to be conservative. Like, hey, I think... When we get down to it, we tend to be more libertarian. But You know, when we have people come to our outreach booths, um, we have a little quiz called the Nolan Quiz. And there's a chart. There's mm-hmm. 10 questions. And people have the opportunity to answer the 10 questions, agree maybe or disagree. And then after they fill out all the answers, then we add them up. And then we have a sticker that we put on the board and it shows where they line up in their thought process. Mm-hmm. In Douglas County especially, uh, I would say about 80% of the people fall, fall right smack dab in the middle of the libertarian philosophy. And when you ask them how long they've been a libertarian, well, I'm not, I'm a Democrat, or right. I'm a Republican. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because they align with the libertarian belief system, but yet they're affiliating with other parties. And once again, I think it comes because that happens because people aren't aware of um, where the libertarian party actually stands. Yeah, or and... You know, Republican, Democrat, they dominate the conversation all the time and they get most of the <clears throat> the publicity, right? And so people you think know, that's that, the only two options. And that's designed. Yeah. Um, when the League of Women Voters gave up their contract to do the uh, uh, TV debates, you know who owns it now? The, the uh, Republicans and Democrats yep. jointly own it. Uh-huh. And that's why they keep raising the, the threshold in order to get a third-party candidate in. And that happened right mm-hmm. after Ross Perot trashed the Republican Party <laughs> in 92, I believe it was. They didn't want that again. Right. Yeah. And they didn't want that to happen again. So they wanted to keep the ball just between, you know, the play just between the Republicans and Democrat Party. So that's why the uh, Libertarians haven't been, been given a stage. And that's also keeping our word from getting exposed to the public. Right. And I... I... I guess on more a personal note, I remember that back in the 2016 election that uh, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld were campaigning hard to get into the debates because mm-hmm. they weren't able to. And I, and I think that's sad, and I think that's that's not good for our democracy overall when uh, you're not allowing these other um, parties mm-hmm. that are legitimate to debate. You need to give you people know, as, that choice. As long as the party has ballot access in 50 states, they should be given a mic. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they don't, then that's an argument that could be had. There's a good argument on both sides of it. Yeah. Uh, but frankly, if you had a party like the Green Party that only has uh, ballot access in a little bit more than half the states, um, they should be heard as well. Mm-hmm. Because if they were heard, maybe they would have ballot access in all 50 states. Right. If right. people if people aligned with their philosophy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what part do your politics play in your faith community? Uh, do you have a faith community? I certainly do. So um, do politics determine uh, church that you choose? Have you ever felt alienated in church because of your political beliefs? Uh, I've never experienced that, but I've had very, very little conversation about politics at any church I've ever sure. been to. Um, I think that if somebody were to pin us down and I, were to, and I were to talk about the libertarian position on abortion, there would be some churches that would certainly uh, take a position against us, but mm-hmm. we've never been asked. Right. Um, so we've not been alienated in any way in any church that we've been to. Yeah. Does the, um, just interesting, I don't know this part of the libertarian party, <laughs> but the abortion issue, would that, the libertarian stance I'm guessing is that is... A, pers- a freedom and a right for people to choose on that, and so you're okay with it being legal. Is that would that be the understanding? It kind is. Of? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it, there, there are many people with many different philosophies on abortion that are libertarians. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally am a pro-life person. Mm-hmm. So is my wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, she wrote a uh, very, very extensive letter that I will send to you. 
um, Jordan, after our interview here, um, on libertarian and the abortion position. And she was the first one to actually do an espousal study on the, on the, on the position of uh, abortion and how the Libertarian Party aligns not with or against it. Mm -hmm. um, but once again, we believe that people should have the, uh, the rights to run their own life in the way that they see fit as long as they're not hurting somebody else. Right. Now, the abortion issue says that they are hurting somebody else. Uh -huh. um, the problem with that is that somebody's going to get hurt when there is an unwanted pregnancy. Either the woman is going to be hurt because if she goes through an abortion, she's going to not only have the pain of that, but also the ongoing pain that we know goes on forever. Mm -hmm. um, but if she is, um, uh, if she does have an abortion, uh, and we know that the, the baby then is killed, and I believe that a baby uh, starts at conception, you know, mm -hmm. the child is a person at conception. Uh, so that's one area that I really struggle with with the Libertarian Party, and I understand why they why they're taking the stand that they do because they don't want to see anybody's rights violated, right. whether it's the mother's or the child's. Um, and once again, I'll send you uh, my wife's writing on this because I think you'll find it to be very interesting. There's no answer that's perfect on this. Sure. Um, I think the best way to handle abortion, and this is Wayne talking, not the Libertarian Party, mm -hmm. um, is for... Uh, further education to be given to women and to make sure that they have all the information so that they can make an informed decision. And then also there needs to be a, a, a much cheaper and more effective manner in order for them to bear a child and give it up for adoption because there's a lot of people that are looking to adopt children and it's very expensive for them. Mm -hmm. shouldn't be. Right. Uh, but it's very expensive for them and it's a lengthy process. Yeah. And um, that needs to be streamlined. Uh, that would, I think that would do more for reducing the amount of abortions than anything else that could happen is if, if women were given a choice, okay, you have an opportunity to, to uh, have your baby adopted, give that baby life, mm -hmm. and then have that baby adopted, the amount of abortions that we have would go down, but that system is just not in place right now. Right, yeah. Um, do you, somebody I talked to earlier, uh, they, they talked about they haven't, really witnessed or uh, experienced being alienated from a church community because of their political beliefs, but they remember a time when they're a kid and a pastor had preached from the pulpit, like um, being against the Vietnam War. Uh, do you have any stories about that from anybody you know in the Libertarian Party that kind of, uh, in some some places, church often people will preach politics from the pulpit? Have you ever experienced that? I have to a very limited amount. Um, you know, churches are so afraid of losing their tax exempt status that they're pretty tight lipped right now about mm -hmm. politics. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a time about 10 years ago that um, some churches were exposing the different candidates' views, and they weren't they weren't trying to do anything more than educate their uh, uh, their parishioners. Yeah. Um, and they almost locked, they had to go to court, and it was a very expensive process for them. Uh, and th so they had to stop that. And all they were doing was educating the people about this person believes in this, this person believes in this. Where do you stand on it and vote appropriately? Yeah. And uh, um, so the churches are afraid right now uh, to speak about anything that lines up with politics. And that's unfortunate because, uh, frankly, a lot of times the parishioners either don't have the time or are not really interested in learning. Uh, but then they have the opportunity to vote. Mm -hmm. And uninformed voters are a problem. And, you know, yeah. There's a big push in our world for everybody to vote, but an uninformed voter um, is not really doing the country any good. Yeah, yeah. What do you think of members of an opposing party? Do you view them as your neighbors, or do you view, view them as political enemies? No, they're absolutely neighbors. No yeah. question about it. Uh, the Libertarian Party is all-inclusive. Mm -hmm. And we're not a club. And we don't say that you can't join us unless you align with us 100%. We don't have a, we don't have a litmus test, if you will. Um, a lot of people that come to the Libertarian Party come from the Democrats, about 21%. Um, from the Republicans, about 20%. Uh, from the Independents, 
that don't have a party affiliation. That's about 26% of the people that come to the Libertarian Party. And the balance of the people are people that would never vote at all for either of the other two parties. And mm-hmm. then finally they join the Libertarian Party. So, you know, people say that the Libertarian Party is a spoiler for the Republican Party as the Green Party is a spoiler for the Democrats. Yeah. It's not true because the Green Party certainly is a spoiler for the Democrats because they're all Democrats anyway. Right. They just take a little bit harder line on some things. Yeah. Uh, the Libertarian Party gets people from everywhere, almost in equal amounts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're not a spoiler for anybody. Did that answer well, your question? Yeah. And, well, some would argue then you're a spoiler for all of them, right? Nobody <laughs> owns that... anybody's vote. Right. Everybody should vote their conscience. And um, if, if we're getting an equal amount of votes from Democrats and Republicans, then we're not damaging either. Mm. Well, we're damaging both of those parties equally, and the right. people are just voting their conscience and coming on board with us. And they're the ones that are holding all the power right now, so they, they'll do anything to not... Right. <laughs> let that happen and i like that you know vote your conscious vote vote um uh, your values rather than just party right well you know what's happened jordan over the last few years and i'd say probably since about 1980 uh, but certainly more in the last 16 years uh, people when you talk to them did you you ask the question did you vote for somebody or against somebody Mm. and that may be different this time but Almost everybody says, up in, you know, up until recently, I've just voted against somebody. If they're Republican, they're voting against the Democrats. Yeah. If they're a Democrat, they're voting against the Republicans. They weren't voting for somebody. They're voting against somebody. Yeah. And they're voting against a philosophy. Mm-hmm. And you know, part of that is because of the divide in our country that's unfortunate. Uh, we can't even have a political conversation without things getting sideways right now. And that's unfortunate because... It's an opportunity for us to grow. And if we don't have those conversations that, that talk about the difficult issues, how can we learn as people? Mm-hmm. And we have to have that dialogue so that we can open up our thought process and maybe take in different ideas or certainly ex- uh, explore our own ideas. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they always say never talk about religion or, or uh, uh, politics at the Thanksgiving dinner right. because it always gets sideways. Yeah. Uh, but it should. We should learn how to have a, a, a courteous dialogue so that everybody can learn from everybody else's experiences. And then maybe maybe your opinions on some things will change. Maybe not. Mm-hmm. Maybe the person you're discussing things with will have a change of heart. If not, as long as it's courteous and loving, there's no reason that, that anything should go sideways to the point that it causes a family division. Right. Yeah. And I think actually that idea of we don't talk about religion or politics has hurt us because Very much. then we know that we're not supposed to talk about it. So we've never had practice in talking right. about it. Um, and yeah, it, there's something you said earlier in that, that I'm trying to remember back, but, um, I lost it, I think, but, uh, I, you know, I liked everything you said about that. And we've been trying to work at least here at new hope about, the polarization Mm -hmm. that we have and uh how do we how do we bring people to the table how do we uh, get people to sit down and talk to each other Uh, just on tuesday night we have theology on tap Uh, we go to wild blue yonder here in town Mm -hmm. uh once a month and we have a topic and people can have beers and we discuss this this uh this time was uh immigration because we had a couple of women from our church who went down to the uh, El Paso uh, Juarez border and uh, kind of saw what was all going on and stuff. And, and so they got to tell their story about that. And then we just talked about, and we, we learn how to talk to each other. Number one, the number one rule of theology on tap is don't be a jerk. And uh, the other ones are listening well, nobody, no soapboxes, nobody gets the last word type of thing. Uh, or dominate the conversation. Uh, and it's just a practice in trying to listen better to each other because we don't do that. Yeah. We, we listen to react, right? You know, the, the immigration issue is a very difficult issue. Um, Libertarian Party b- believes, as a party, believes that we should have open borders because people are people. Mm-hmm. And the people that are coming here, with only a few exceptions, 
uh, are here to better their lives and better their lives for their family. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to feed your children. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a lot of other countries, they don't have the opportunity to do that, at least on a regular basis. And we believe in open borders. There are certain people within the Libertarian Party that do believe in closed border, but they need to open up the immigration system to make it much more graceful and ha happen much more quickly. Yeah. Uh, I fall in that second category. Yeah. Um, because there are some people that are coming into our country through our southern border that are here to do us damage, and we need to have an opportunity to, to stop them. Mm -hmm. uh, without a border wall, we don't have that. Um, but we also have to make things much more graceful for the people that just want to come here, work, provide for their families, and give their families a better opportunity. That's why my ancestors came here. Yeah, yeah. From Europe. Yeah. Well, and, and there's always a balance, too, because it's... It's hard to, the idea of just opening the borders too, then what happens when you have a sudden influx of mass of people, right? And just all the logistical stuff that goes along with that. Um, but it, it's a complicated issue that we've tried to make into a um, black and white issue. Well, they're trying right? to turn it into political football because yeah. both of the major parties, for all intents and purposes, they're the same. Uh, the Republicans take their position as a pro-gun people, mm -hmm. Democrats anti-gun. They're both hanging their hats because they have to have something to posture about. Mm -hmm. Same thing on abortion. Republicans are, are against abortion. Democrats are, are for abortion, mm -hmm. or certainly for the choice of abortion. And uh, once again, it's a political uh, opportunity for posturing. Let's talk about the uh, uh, gay marriage thing. Mm -hmm. um, the Democrat Party up until recently was not for gay marriage. Libertarian has been since its inception in 1972. We're not for gay marriage, but we are for the people's right to get married if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are a lot of Christians within the libertarian circles uh, that are that they believe that marriage is, should be between a man and a woman, but if two men or two women want to get married, um, who are we to say if they shouldn't have that opportunity to? It has to do with freedom. Mm -hmm. Once again, the responsibility that goes along with that. The Libertarian Party doesn't believe that society as a whole should regulate the behavior of people as long as their behavior is not hurting others. Thank you for joining us on this journey. And I think the call now after four episodes is to not just listen to podcasts, but go out into your neighborhoods, your community, your family, your church, and try and have these conversations in real life, reminding yourself to love one another and to love God. A Bigger Table is a series on Voices of Hope, which is a podcast of New Hope Presbyterian Church in Castle Rock, Colorado. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review it, share it with your friends. We will see you next time.